So there is a wide variety of different oncological emergencies that can occur that involve critical care. Pericardial effusions are just one of them. Now, unlike the superior vena cava, the pericardium is actually a very non-compliant uh, organ, a bag that basically doesn't stretch very much when, uh, when it's exposed even to pressure. The pericardium itself can become irritated, usually when there's tumors that affect the uh, uh, that metastasize from other sites, primarily the lung and the breast, that irritate the pericardium and then cause it to develop a sympathetic effusion. Now, as, as uh, similar to other causes of effusion, the ability of the pericardium uh, to accommodate to the, to the, um, uh, to the effusion uh, and to grow and expand depends really on the rapidity of growth. So for tumors that are slower growing, cause less irritation, it may take longer for, a pericardi for the effusion to become more of a problem, while the pericardium itself can actually expand to accommodate the extra fluid. Other more aggressive tumors that tend to irritate a lot more or worse, cause bleeding, will tend to cause uh, problems a lot sooner because the pericardium simply doesn't have time to accommodate. So, the pericardial effusions from a malignancy have a lot of the same symptoms that you would find with anybody who has a pericardial effusion. Exertional dyspnea will probably be the most common finding presenting complaint. When you examine the patient, they'll usually have a, a pulsus paradoxus, uh, and this will occur in about 77% of people, especially as they're approaching tamponade. Bex triad, which is something you probably learned in medical school and rapidly forgot, is a triad uh, that, if, that uh, is the combination of hypotension, increased JVP, and decreased heart sounds. Um, is not often uh, frequent, is not often found, but when it is, it's usually found in frequent in uh, rapidly forming effusions that are now approaching tamponade. Your chest X-ray will show an enlarged heart. Um, and for reasons that escape me, if you choose to do a Swan-Gans catheter to try and sort out uh, what's going on, they may be a um, they, they'll show they may show tamponade physiology. Which spoiler alert: if you're doing an exam in the near future, you need to know what an, what uh, tamponade physiology looks like because it'll come up. But to be realistic, the vast majority of people are going to make the diagnosis of a pericardial effusion, particularly that on the basis of a malignancy, using an echocardiogram. The echocardiogram, which can usually be performed at the bedside and give you a quick look at the, at the pericardium and the heart function, it's quick and easy and can be both diagnostic as well as eventually therapeutic. So the initial treatment for pericardial effusion can be a little tricky. Patients are often presenting in some form of respiratory distress and you need to act quickly to identify both what the cause is and then start initial in interventions. Your, some of your initial investigations may not necessarily give you the clue and unless you have a history of a, of a previous metastatic breast or lung cancer, you may not be necessarily clued into the fact that this is a pericardial effusion. So when people present with exertional dyspnea or dyspnea even at rest, and, or elevated JVP, you need to think quickly and hard about whether or not an effusion, a pericardial effusion and tamponade are actually the problem. Now, initial treatment can be dicey, though, because in some cases, a patient may actually be hypovolemic. They may not have been getting up. They may have lost energy. They may, not be, uh, they may be behind on their fluid. And in that case, then giving some initial fluid resuscitation may actually be helpful. However, you have to be very careful because you may approach rapidly a tipping point where if the patient is euvolemic or overloaded, they may actually, you may actually make matters worse, especially with the right heart. The treatment of choice is to do an, emer uh, an emergency pericardiocentesis, and then oftentimes what you'll need is uh, your colleagues from cardiology to come and help you with putting the echo probe on, finding the location, <clears throat> and then performing the procedure. Occasionally, you may need to do this yourself um, at the bedside, and I would encourage you to uh, practice this in, uh, uh, in uh, both in simulation and also uh, if you have access to cadaver labs to have a full um, understanding of how to do this procedure rapidly. But if you live in a, in a center that has easy access to echocardiograms and to cardiologists, I would defer to their expertise in this situation. Now in the long term, some people may require uh, repeated drainage and in some cases they may actually leave a drain in place so they can just be opened and closed as necessary to, uh, to relieve any excess pressure. Occasionally people will, uh, if they're referred to cardiac surgeons, may decide to do sclerosis in order to try and, um, try and 
uh, reduce the amount of effusion that's produced, primarily as a palliative procedure, but also recognizing that you now create a restrictive uh, my, uh, uh, pericardium, which creates its own sources of problems. And then the definitive surgical procedure is a pericardial window, which would be performed, obviously, by your cardiac surgeons. At all points in time, this is, uh, this is a very ominous finding with, uh, when it's associated with malignancy. And I, I think it's at that point you need to have some full, frank discussion with the patient and the family about their, uh, about their end of life care and their goals of care, because this is obviously not something that will be cured. Most of these malignancies are already metastatic. All right, well, that's everything. Thanks for watching. And as always, if you have any questions, don't uh, be afraid to leave comments in the section below or contact me directly.